Hey everybody, welcome. Thanks so much for taking some time to uh, participate in our monthly leadership video. We've been a series now for quite a while where we were looking at um, some of the examples of leadership that is set out by Francis Chan in his latest book, Letters to the Church, in chapter 6, where he talks about what it means to be a good shepherd, to be a good pastor, to be a good leader. And we're making applications from those things to all of our specific areas of ministry, whether that be small groups, whether that be dream teams, whether that be leadership in the marketplace or in academia, wherever it is that we find ourselves, we can apply these basic principles to our life and to our leadership to see our teams and our missions move forward specifically in a way that brings honor and glory to Christ. So today we want to look at the suffering leader. Now I know the minute I say that, someone is going to immediately think, Jerry, Jesus doesn't want us to suffer, right? He wants us blessed. He said it over and over. But I want you to know with absolute certainty that there, those two ideas, suffering and blessing, that they are in no way mutually exclusive of one another, that oftentimes we experience them simultaneously and for the same reason and to the same outcome. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, said it this way. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy or blessing. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. And when your endurance is fully developed, it'll be perfect and complete and you'll need nothing. Now, I know some of you are going to say, Jerry, that's really not talking about suffering per se. That's more talking about the obstacles and the, the lessons that we have to learn along the way in order to be fully developed. But what verse 2 specifically says in the actual language with full intent is when troubles of any kind. So sometimes, of course, there'll be obstacles and lessons and hurdles to be overcome, but sometimes they will be suffering. Sometimes our people will face obstacles that need to be overcome. And sometimes our people will face suffering. And when our people experience pain and suffering, they need more than words. They need an example of leaders who have learned how to rejoice in the midst of suffering. So take a moment. Just kind of pause wherever you are. Driving down the road, making dinner, sitting at your desk. Just stop and consider, contemplate your words, your actions when you're going through rough times. And ask the question, would people, would your people, your kids, your friends, your co-workers, your classmates, would they see in you when you are suffering the forbearance and the endurance of Christ? I think we too quickly, especially as leaders, get discouraged and want to quit or talk about quitting because we've not learned the, the capacity, the, the behavior, the, the habit of rejoicing in suffering. Francis Chan in his book said this, he said, show me a pastor or a leader who rejoices in suffering and I'll show you a pastor or a leader who will be in ministry a long time. When we have leaders and pastors who rejoice in suffering and they're making disciples, we're going to end up with an unstoppable church. So I really want to focus today on actually, this is such an important part that Francis Chan focuses all of his attention in his next chapter, chapter 7 in his book, on this idea of pain and suffering. His, his chapter heading is titled, Crucified. And in there, he observes that he was talking with a missionary on a foreign field, and he was asking him what pillars, what basic ideas, what tenets, what core values they focus on. And as he flashed through the first four, he thought, oh, those, those sound normal, those sound like the same kinds of things that we deal with. And then he got to number five, and when Francis heard it, he had to pause, because he said the last pillar that he teaches his young converts is that they have to, in, they have to embrace suffering for the glory of Christ. Imagine. Imagine teaching as a core value of your church. One of our core values is have fun, and I believe in that with all my heart. But one of their core values of the persecuted church around the world is learn to embrace suffering for the glory of Christ. 
One time, some of the, the, the apostles um, had gotten captured by the Jewish high council, and they were considering what it was that they were going to do. And eventually, the high council called them out of, uh, out of bondage, out of prison, out of jail. And Acts chapter 5, verse 40 says, They called the apostles, and they had them flogged. They had them beaten. And then they ordered them never again to speak, to teach, to perform miracles, not to do anything in the name of Jesus, and they just let them go. Verse 41, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Now, in this particular case, the disciples are faced with actually two different kinds of suffering. The one they experienced through physical beating. They actually experienced physical harm. The second one is through public humiliation. What is ironic, what is interesting, what is mind-boggling to me is that in verse 41, they don't even acknowledge the physical assault that they endured. The only thing that they notice is the public disgrace. But the most important thing in this passage, the most important thing in this story, are these couple little words at the end of verse 41. For the name of Jesus. Guys, it's important to realize we're not masochists. We don't like abuse. We don't like pain. We don't need pain in order to experience joy. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is willing to do anything for the glory of Jesus. In fact, Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, he said, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of Christ's body, which is the church, in filling up in my body what was lacking in Christ's afflictions. What an interesting idea. What an interesting thing for Paul to say, that he is personally taking on suffering into his physical man to finish the affliction that was begun in Christ. In other words, we suffer, we agonize, we're willing to, to do without for Christ's name, for Christ's sake, to finish what Christ started. Now, I want to give us two overarching principles for us really to consider as we think about this idea of embracing suffering for the glory of Christ, because it's very important that we get this sort of set right, because this could fly off in some weird directions, and we don't ever want that to happen. So the first thing that we understand is what we're pursuing is Jesus, not suffering. Say that with me. We pursue Jesus, not suffering. Philippians 3, verse 8 through 11 says, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for His sake. I have discarded everything else. It's only for Christ that we're willing to set things aside. Counting everything else in my life as garbage so that I could gain everything that there is in Christ. In other words, we just want all of Jesus. And we want others to experience Him too. And so we literally push everything else out of our life, out of our time, out of our attention to allow for more of Christ to come in. And not only so that we could experience Christ, but verse 9, and become one with him so that Christ himself and Christ's kingdom could actually be formed into us, that we would be transformed, reformed, beautified by our experiences and our expressions of Christ in our life. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law, through anything that I could do. Rather, I become righteousness through faith in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Not only do we enter into life in Christ, but we're actually perfected and beautified by our faith in Christ, by our pursuit of Him, by our dependence on Him, by our conviction of Him. Verse 10, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised Him from the dead. I want to suffer with Him, sharing in His death, so that one way or another, I will experience his resurrection from the dead. So the goal is to grow closer to Jesus in greater um, intimacy, in greater understanding, in greater knowledge, in greater appreciation. When we fully fall in love with, with Jesus, 
We'll want to know Him. We'll want to enter into Him, into His life, all of it, even the difficult, even the painful parts. It's our love, it's our longing for Him that leads us into hard places. And that causes our, us to allow our names to be slurred in order to protect His. It'll, it causes us to allow our bodies to suffer for the sake of His body, the church, that it might grow, that it might flourish, that it might be beautified. It's our loving pursuit of Christ that will inevitably lead us into suffering. Christ became nothing so that we could have everything. And if we're going to share in His life, we want to share in His mission of setting men free, it's going to cost us in much the same ways that it cost Him. So the first thing that we're talking about is we pursue Jesus and not suffering. And the second thing is we love people, not suffering. We're not looking for suffering. We're looking for Jesus. And we don't love suffering. We love Jesus' people, the same reason that He came. Colossians 1.24 again. It says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. For I'm participating in the suffering of Christ that continues for His body, the church. We suffer not only for Jesus in His name, but we also do it with Him. We're co-laborers, co-sufferers with Him, in Him, for the body, His body on the earth, which is the church. The same people that Christ came and suffered and died for, we are willing to suffer for. We set aside our time, we set aside our resources, we set aside our ambition for the sake of Christ's kingdom being established in the midst of our schools, in the midst of our workplace, in the midst of our neighborhoods, in the midst of our communities, our cities, our culture. But we can't make these sacrifices begrudgingly or they actually... Um, they actually amount to nothing. They're wasted. They're, they're lost. And they come to nothing. They produce nothing. We actually have to do it with the same love that was in Christ when Christ died if we want our suffering to count for something in His kingdom, to have an impact in the lives of those that we would love, that we would seek to lead. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, Paul says, If I gave everything I had for the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could brag about it. But if I didn't love, if it wasn't love, God's love working in me and through me, well, then I would really gain nothing. Peter, in one of his great letters to the church, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised, don't be unaware that fiery trials are going to come, that you're going to go through them, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering, so that you will have a wonderful joy in seeing His glory when He is revealed in all the earth. You're suffering is actually multiplying the glory of God in the earth, fulfilling the mission of loving people into deeper levels of relationship with Jesus Christ, if we do it well. And if you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. Well, I hope that's an encouragement to you and not a discouragement to you. Suffering is never easy, but it doesn't have to be meaningless if we would take it to Christ and allow those seasons, those times, those sufferings that we don't seek, that we don't love, to produce something of His kingdom in us. And if we would pursue Christ and His people, His mission, even through our suffering. Well, thanks so much for giving us a couple minutes again this month. We love you guys. Appreciate you so much. We are praying for you all the time. If you have any questions, you can reach us here at the church, come to the well.org. Um, you can email me, jerry, at come to the well.org. 
Um, you can call the office at 630-262-1083. Anything we can do to help or serve you, of course we want to. God bless you. I hope you have a great day.